just a little thought I'm having this morning, or continuation of a thought I had when I was having breakfast with my lovely wife as I go anywhere from one to nine miles an hour on the freeway. <laughs> the freeway. <laughs> anyway, we were looking at a blog and listened to a video and thinking about and talking about our old religion, our old construct of man that we used to be in bondage to. And the concept was, is specifically one of, in this one particular video we watched, or a portion of it, it was like 32 minutes, there's no way we're going to watch that mess. But the reason why this person said as, as an apostolic Pentecostal that you should listen to them is because they are the experts on the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Why? Because, he says, because I have personally experienced the exact same thing that they experienced in Acts 2.38. So therefore, listen to me. That whole experience thing is a big thing. I don't think I ever completely got it. That's why I was free to, I was able to get free from it. I, I bought it in my mind. I, I must experience this thing. I must experience it. Experiencing is reality you know feeling is reality but as a, a friend of ours billy at the father's love for you illustrated a while ago it's it's knowing it's not experiencing it's knowing you know the truth yeah you can experience it but you don't have to it's not required you know the truth and the dangers of this type of thinking and what it could get you into I mean, if they believe that, well, it says in the Bible, da 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 therefore, now if I can just conjure up, manufacture this same experience in my life, then therefore I am in the will of God, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And if you take that, well, what if you decide to never cut your hair again? Then you're going to be like Samson. Or it's too late for you, you already cut your hair. You, you can... Uh, raise your son and never cut his hair and do all these things the right way you know have have a woman sleep at your feet and then the both of you will experience the blessings of of Ruth and I'm forgetting her husband or betrothed right now but you see what I'm saying if you say well if I just do these things which from a purely practical standpoint doesn't make a whole lot of sense and more than that, from an intelligence standpoint, it takes away God's personal touch, if you will. That it takes away the notion that he is an individual that is living a life and he will do what he will do. It's important to understand that. He doesn't do the same thing cookie cutter over and over again. And I think that's where confusion comes in, where they say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's true. His character is the same. Christ has always been Christ from the beginning of all creation. That is our one true God. And it's his character, though, that doesn't change. He has clearly showed that he is pragmatic when it comes to bringing souls home to him. He really wants us. And it's not that he compromises. He doesn't compromise. But he clearly talked to the Pharisees and the other religious people of his time differently than he talked to the more open sinners. You know, they're all sinners. It's just that he approached them differently because I don't believe that he, he hated the Pharisees. That's why he was so harsh with them. He was just angry with them because they claimed something. They claimed they knew something. They claimed they were something. And there were none of those things. And the sinners didn't claim to be that. In other words, they were more open to the notion that they needed something. And the religious didn't. And it's the same today. Although I have met sinners that are very self-righteous, which is funny. I mean, sinners in the traditional sense, they'll be self-righteous and, and uh, just have an attitude about their sin. But we all need mercy. We don't stop needing his mercy. Once we get his mercy, we are now not now good. And therefore, we can look down on others. But that's the religious mindset. And so, for whatever reason, these traditions come up. And they turn into this denomination or that denomination. And in the case of my wife and I, it's the Pentecostal 
tradition of men. So it gets its own force going. It started only a little over 100 years ago, but yet it's the Bible truth. Even though it has nothing to do with truth. It invented a new kind of tongues that is not tongues. That is, it's not the tongues of the Bible. It's the tongues of some other spirit, but not the Bible. The, the tongues of the Bible are known languages. It says they heard them speak with tongues and 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 glorify God or praise God for it. Which, oh, it says that in chapter 10 of Acts, but they knew they were praising God, so they they it was a language they all knew. They were just speaking a language they did not know, and were that is the speakers did not know. The the hearers knew the speakers were speaking a language unbeknownst to them. That was the proof. That was the proof. What what is happening in churches today, anyone can do. Anyone can do. Any any non-believing, even anti-believer can do everything that is done in a Pentecostal church. Every single thing, one of those things can be done. But to put faith in your God, that's also something anyone can do, but no one does it. I mean, virtually no one. It's a very unusual thing to see someone actually put faith in their God. And it's a huge thing. And you can tell just by looking at it. I mean, I'm no fruit inspector, but those people were not putting faith in God. They were putting faith in what they're doing, their denomination, their routines, their traditions, their gymnastics, their ABC, one, two, three, don't worry me, whatever it is they thought they should be doing. But it had nothing to do with reality. So just the, I got off track there a little bit. Just consider that if Acts 2.38 or whatever it is you think, you, you know, Matthew 28.19, Whatever it is, you look in the Bible and say, oh, I got to do that. Well, why shouldn't you be doing the Samson thing? And I know people say, well, yeah, sure, sure. They, they, they do the Daniel diet or fast or whatever. They come up with all these things, not considering the fact that their God is still alive. He didn't just stop living at the end of the writings of the Bible. He's still living and he's still doing things. And, and you are living. So... Why not live your life with that in mind and see what he has for you? Because he's not done. He's not done communicating to us what he has for us to do. He's really not. Think about that. Do you think he's done communicating with the ending of the writing of that book? I'm not saying that there's these new truths. They're all, it all has to harmonize with the Bible, of course. Because that is his testimony. It's just that there's many ways of getting to know God. Because that's the whole purpose of it. But when you turn it into this religious function, this series of activities and gymnastics or, or consecrations and the different things people do, then it's just a religious activity. It's not getting to know anyone. It's getting to know your denomination is getting to know the rules of your building it has nothing to do with getting to know God getting to know God is getting to know someone and because you're different he's gonna deal with you different than he dealt with them obviously there was totally different circumstances he dealt with them the way you would deal with a, a Jewish person when the Holy Spirit first poured out on the very day there's a different way God has of dealing with people on the day that his, he poured out his spirit himself over all flesh than after he had done it 2,000 years ago. Still the same spirit, still the same God, still the same salvation, still the same opportunity to have a relationship. It's just that now we have this different life, different world. And just as he dealt with the Pharisees differently than he dealt with a tax collector or a harlot or some other garden variety sinner or Samaritan, whoever it was he's dealing with, now he deals with us on an individual basis. We're all individuals. We don't need to do this cookie cutter thing. There is one thing I believe that's universal though. You need to come to the reality of the fact that your father loves you and he loves you so much he became a man and came here and gave himself for you as the son of his own love. That's something we all should know. But the way you're going to find that out is unique to you. It's totally unique to you. I can't give it to you. 
No one can. Only he can. That's the whole point. It's relational. So it's when your God tells you, when your God informs your heart, hey, my child, it's me. I'm the one who came for you because I love you. And when you put your faith in that, then you, you have that relationship. And then it's not about dying the I's and crossing the T's and wearing the proper uniform and the proper building with the proper denomination. It's just living your life. It's just different than any other life you had before that because now you're living it with your father. And the two of you will experience things as you go. And that's amazing. I just recommend that you try that sometime. Don't worry about not cutting your hair or doing something in Acts 2.38 and making sure you do what some man or men or women or groups of men and women say that you should do, but rather simply live your life knowing your Father loves you. Do you believe that? Seriously, ask yourself these questions. Do I believe my Father loves me? Do I believe I can trust Him? And even if you really have this strong identity with your denomination, I, I can understand that. I can. We all had different levels of it. I did a certain level. It, I wasn't deeply, profoundly in love with my religion, but I was very religious. And there is a certain fear factor involved with r even risking cutting loose with that. But ask yourself, do I trust him enough that if he told me I don't belong here, I do it. Not that I'm going to leave because Mark said so, because I'm not telling you to leave anyway. I'm just saying, just ask yourself these questions. If the Spirit told me, but if your mind is such that, you, well, the Spirit would never say that. No, because I belong here because, because that's what I learned in church. Well, no. What did, what did the Spirit of God tell you? What did your Father tell you? He's like, Lord, would you still be with me? If I walked out them doors and never came back in, would you still be with me? Because someday it might happen by force. Someday might, you might have no choice about it. The point is, is who's going to be your God on that day? Who's going to be your God? Who? Not what. Not gr what group of who's. But who? Who is the individual that's going to be your God? That's why he said, in that day, they shall be my people and I shall be their God. He was saying that when Israel was ostensibly his people, he's talking about something that was yet to come. And that was after he poured his spirit out. Why would he say that? Because they, they weren't truly his people. He did not dwell within them as he did in the garden. So now there's the opportunity for him to dwell within you and for him to actually be your God and for you to be the temple of God. So if you're the temple of God, wherever you are is the temple of God. So consider these things. That's all I asked you to do because even in the Bible, I don't see where they said, let's look and see what so-and-so did and did, do what so-and-so did. You'll see them doing things like Elijah. It's like, wow, why did he do that? It doesn't say, and God came and told him, and he just did it. A lot of these guys just did things because they were so led of the Spirit, apparently. I don't know. There might be some times where they did things on their own. That one was, was it Elisha when he... He said something to those kids after they insulted him and a bear came out of the, the woods and mauled them. I don't know if that God wanted that. I really don't. I don't assume that God wanted that because he obviously didn't want a lot of other things. He didn't want David and, and Solomon and all those kings having multiple wives. He clearly did not want that. We were doing things just as you do things now. It's just now we have benefit of the spirit living within. Not the convict and condemn but to guide and to teach and to comfort and to show as you go so you can learn the two of you again the two of you this is about relationship so ask yourself these questions look at this is your identity i'm a proud insert denomination here or is your identity i'm a father's child thank you jesus and all the rest is just details that's the one thing you got to have for anything else to even matter. So I'm a, a done ranting or pontificating, however you want to put that. I would say God bless us all. God continue to bless us. He always does. He's a good God. He never stops blessing us. And I just pray that we all learn to see that a little bit more, that we have actually received all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus and everything that pertains to life and godliness, just like the Bible says. 
That's my singing for the day. Anyway, God bless us all. In Jesus' name.